Είμαι ο Γιώργος Αρχόντας. Θέλω να σας ευχαριστήσω για τη σημερινή σας παρουσία στο πρώτο ε, φιλελεύθερο masterclass που οργανώνει το ΚΕΦΥΜ. Είναι μεγάλη χαρά και τιμή μας να έχουμε σήμερα στην, ε, μαζί μας και στην Ελλάδα τον ε, καθηγητή Στίβεν Χόρβιτς ε, και την Σάρα ε, Σκουάιρ, καθώς και τον ε, διευθυντή ε, μελετών, ερευνών, ερευνών ε, του ΚΕΦΥΜ, τον καθηγητή Αριστίδη Χατζή. Είναι, η, όπως είπα πριν, η πρώτη, ε, το πρώτο φιλελεύθερο masterclass που οργανώνουμε και θέλω να σας ε, ζητήσω ε, να παρακολουθήσετε, να εγγραφείτε στο newsletter του ΚΕΦΥΜ και να παρακολουθείτε τα νέα μας, γιατί από το 2020 οι εκπαιδευτικές μας δράσεις θα γίνουν ακόμα ε, περισσότερες, ακόμα ε, πλουσιότερες και πιστεύω και ενδιαφέρουσες. Ε, θέλουμε να εμπλέξουμε σε αυτό ε, τόσο νέους ανθρώπους, φοιτητές, όσο και γενικότερα ανθρώπους οι οποίοι ενδιαφέρονται να ε, έρθουν πιο κοντά, ε, να μάθουν περισσότερα πράγματα για τις ιδέες της ελευθερίας. Ε, δύο λόγια για τους ε, ομιλητές μας. Ο καθηγητής Στίβεν Φόρβιτς είναι κατέχει τη διακεκριμένη έδρα ελεύθερης επιχειρηματικότητας στο ε, ε, Miller College of Business του Ball State University στην ε, Ινδιάνα. Ε, έχει γράψει δύο ε, κυρίως ε, μονογραφίες το Micro Foundations and Macroeconomics και το Hayex Family, Modern Family, uh, The Evolution of Social, uh, Classical Liberalism and the Evolution of uh, Social Institutions. Uh, θα τον έχετε δει τόσο στο, στα βίντεο του Len Liberty, τα οποία εδώ και αρκετά χρόνια uh, μεταφράζει το ΚΕΦΥΜ, όσο και σε άρθρα τα οποία δημοσιεύονται στη στήλη think tanks του Liberal. Το τελευτα... το τελευταία... Τελευταίες δύο εβδομάδες, πριν από δύο εβδομάδες νομίζω, κυκλοφόρησε και από την εφημερίδα Φιλελεύθερο, στο πλαίσιο της συνεργασίας που έχουμε με το ΚΕΦΥΜ, ένα βιβλίο με μια συλλογή από άρθρα που έχουμε μεταφράσει και έχουμε δημοσιεύσει. Το καθηγητή Χόρβιτς. Ανάμεσα στα ενδιαφέροντά του είναι η νομισματική θεωρία, τα μακροοικονομικά και η ιστορία των, ε, ε, των οικονομικών και των ε, κοινωνικών θεωριών με ιδιαίτερη έμφαση στο έργο του Φρίντριχ Χάγεκ. Η Σάρα Σκουάρ είναι ποιήτρια, είναι μέλος του Liberty Inc. των ε, στελεχών και έχει ε, συγγράψει ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον εγχειρίδιο γραφής με τίτλο «Writing with a Thesis». Ε, επίσης, ε, πολλά άρθρα της έχουν δημοσιευθεί ε, τόσο στο, ε, στο, στο Liberal όσο και στον ε, Φιλελεύθερο. Ε, άρθρα με θεματολογία όπως η ε, λογοτεχνία ε, και η ελευθερία, ένα θέμα για το οποίο θα μας μιλήσει σήμερα, ε, ο φεμινισμός ε, και η ελευθερία και η συσχέτιση της ε, Φιλελεύθερη σκέψη με τις μεγάλες παραδόσεις τόσο την ελληνική όσο και της ε, ε, Ιουδαϊκής σκέψη. Ε, τον καθηγητή Χατζή, φαντάζομαι τον γνωρίζετε, αν όχι όλοι τουλάχιστον οι περισσότεροι, ε, είναι καθηγητής ε, πολιτικής φιλοσοφίας και θεωρίας θεσμών. Φιλοσοφίας, φιλοσοφίας δικαίου και θεωρίας θεσμών. Φιλοσοφία. Κάνει και πολιτική φιλοσοφία. Εγώ ως πολιτικό φιλόσοφο τον γνωρίζω, κυρίως, στο τμήμα ε, μεθοδολογίας της ιστορίας. Η ιστορία και φιλοσοφία της επιστήμης. Έχω διδάξει και εκεί και δεν το θυμάμαι καλά. Καλά είναι πρωί ακόμα και δεν έχω πιει. Μάλλον έχω πιει καφέ, αλλά πολλές ώρες πριν. Ε, του, του ΕΚΠΑ, του Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών. Είναι διευθυντής ερευνών του ΚΕΦΥΜ και υπεύθυνο ενό πολύ φιλόδοξου προγράμματος που τρέχουμε το τελευταίο διάστημα στο ΚΕΦΥΜ και αφορά την ανάδειξη των φιλελεύθερων ιδεών που ενέπνευσαν ε, την Ελληνική Επανάσταση με αφορμή τα 200 χρόνια από την, ε, από την Επανάσταση του 1821 που θα γιορτάσουμε σε ένα έτος, θεωρώ το 19 ήδη κλεισμένο. Ε, αυτά ως εισαγωγικά. It is a great pleasure and honor to have you here in, in Greece. 
And uh, I'm honored to present the floor to you, Professor Horowitz. One of the problems being introduced in a language you don't speak is you just have to assume that people are saying nice things about you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, is, yeah, I think so. The mic, we're okay in the mic? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, good morning. Uh, my other thing I will start with this morning, first of all, thank you all for having me here. Thank you to, to Kevin and everyone for bringing, for bringing both of us over. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. We have both, Sarah and I have both traveled a fair amount, especially her in Europe. Turns out neither one of us has ever been to Greece before, so this is a great opportunity for us to be here. And we're, really, we're really, really happy, and I'm also very much looking forward to, to Tuesday night. Uh, the other thing I'll say off the start is I tend to talk fast. I'm going to try my best <laughs> not to. Uh, I know it's hard for you listening in, the, in what's probably the second language, so uh, I've got slides, but I'm going to try to keep my pace my face moderate. So what I want to do this morning is to talk about Austrian economics. And as my title suggests, I want to talk about what Austrian economics is and what it is not. And I think this is a really important topic to, to think about, especially for young people who are perhaps just getting started in, 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 in sort of thinking about these ideas and, and being exposed to them for the, for the first time, or not maybe not the first time, but, but uh, one of the first times. So I want to start by making one simple point that's going to be a bit of a theme, which is that Austrian economics is not free market economics. It is true that Austrian, most Austrian economists are mostly in favor of, of free markets and classical liberalism and all those other things. But the important thing, to, important thing to remember off the top is that Austrian economics is a framework for social scientific analysis. It's, it's a set of theories, a set of ideas that we use to try to understand the world. Now, it turns out, I think, that if you, uh, if you do this right, you, you will generally come to classical liberal policy conclusions. You will think that freedom is a good idea. It's not just a coincidence that most of the people who we think of as names associated with Austrian economics, like Mises and Hayek and so forth, were in fact classical liberals. But there are many economists and others who are classical liberals who are not Austrian economists. And there have been, and are some today, people who would call themselves Austrian economists who aren't especially classical liberal. So I think that's a really important play, place to start. All right? And I think this matters because it matters for how we talk about ideas and how we influence the world of ideas. If we think it's important that Austrian ideas uh, uh, become part of the discourse, part of how people talk in economics, I think it's important for us to separate out those ideas, Austrian economics, from the policy. And my talk today is actually based on a terrific piece uh, by my longtime friend and, and, and partner in crime, Pete Becky, on the 10, 10 propositions he says that define Austrian economics. And you can find that in the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, which you can find at, at the Liberty Fund site. Uh, and, and can certainly Google it very easily. I should note, for those of you who are students, this is an exceptionally good resource to use if you're looking to understand basic <coughs> ideas in economics. It has these sort of very uh, readable, accessible, not very long articles on a whole bunch of different topics. And the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, all of it's online. Uh, in that piece, Pete Becky sort of divides Austrian economics up into three pieces. I don't know how well you can see that from here. Methodology. Microeconomics, macroeconomics, and I'm going to follow that pattern as I go through today. And we're going to walk through his 10 propositions. I'm going to just sort of name each one of them. Then I'm going to kind of circle back and group some of them together and talk about them as a kind of cluster of ideas that, that explain how Austrian economists think about the world. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to come back to sort of where I started and talk about the relationship between Austrian economics and libertarianism, classical liberalism, whatever word one wants to use for it. Uh, last thing I'll say before I do all that is I think it is dangerous in some sense. It's a problem for Austrian economists and for classical liberalism 
when we kind of conflate those two things, when we push them together. Uh, too often, I think there are people who are, are who use the word Austrian to describe all kinds of different things that might have nothing to do with Austrian economics. And that ends up making it more difficult to get the ideas of Austrian economics and I think the ideas of classical liberalism out there and influencing people in the way, in the way that they go. Okay, so with all that out of the way, we're still feeding back a little bit, there we go. With all that out of the way, uh, let's talk about these 10 propositions and see what Austrian economics is about. Methodology, how do we do economics? All right, first proposition, only individuals choose. Right? And I think that's an important one, one we'll come back to and, and emphasize. But when we think about analyzing economic behavior, we often talk, we say things like the government did something, or we say things like uh, Amazon did something. But in the end, only individuals choose. Even within organizations, only individuals choose. Proposition two, the study of the market order is fundamentally about exchange and the institutions within which exchange take place. This, I, again, also very important, right? When we think about and we sort of talk about economics, what are we trying to understand? When we're trying to understand the market, what we're trying to understand is, how, is the exchanges people engage in. But we always have to understand that those are taking place within an institutional order, within, uh, I, I don't use the phrase here, but within rules of the game. What are the rules by which people are engaging in exchange? Those, that's the core of our, of our analysis. And proposition three, the facts of the social sciences are what people believe and think. Now this is a more interesting one. This is often what Austrians call subjectivism, right? That what matters is what people think about the world. Those are the facts we have to start with. When we analyze human behavior, it doesn't matter whether the things people believe are true or not. What matters is what they believe. So when we think about why certain things have value, for example, right? I might, you know, I, I don't like, let's take a good, uh, we've been listening to, we've been, we've been hearing all this country music since we've been in Greece, which is, we're, we're trying to figure that one out, okay? I don't particularly like country music, right? Uh, but, but the fact that I don't like it isn't, isn't the issue, right? As long as people like it, it has value, and that's what matters, right? And so when we think even about what we think facts are in the social sciences, what people, what people base their actions on, are the things they believe, right? And we have to start with the things they believe if we want to understand what their actions are. So those are the three propositions in methodology. What about in microeconomics? Utility and costs are subjective. As I already suggested, right, that what, what, people, what people value and how people understand the idea of cost is, is up to them, it's their choosing, their perceptions of the world. As, as uh, our friend Deidre McCloskey likes to say, economics is what happens between your ears, right? That your perceptions of the world, your beliefs drive your understanding of what costs are and the things that you value. I don't like country music, I don't pay for it, other people do, right? They are willing, they're willing to, to pay for it and buy it. Proposition five, the price system economizes on the information people need to uh, process in making their decisions because prices are knowledge surrogates. One of the core ideas in Austrian economics, uh, and comes from Hayek, of course, right? This idea that prices help, uh, help provide us with knowledge and provide us with information that we need in order to coordinate uh, within the marketplace. So we'll come back to that and say a lot more about that in a little bit. Proposition six, private property in the means of production is a necessary condition for rational economic calculation. This, of course, is from Mises, right? And the idea is that we cannot have an economy in which we can figure out what to do and how to do things. That is, we can't have rational economic calculation. We can't have progress, we won't have progress, unless we have private property. And in particular, private property in the means of production, private property in capital. But number seven, the competitive market is a process of entrepreneurial discovery. Those of you, know, of you who know a little bit about Austrian economics might recognize this as Israel Kirzner, which it is. Uh, and Kirzner's idea, and it's certainly one that we see in Mises and Hayek as well, is that competition in the marketplace is a learning process. It's how we figure things out. We don't know how best to do things. The way we learn how best to do things is through competition. 
Uh, I often analogize this, and there's limits to this, but you can analogize this to competition in sports, right, where we have two teams play a game to figure out, right, who the best team is. That's how we know who the best team is. We know, <laughs> we know uh, because we let them play, right? If we, uh, we discovered yesterday when we checked into the hotel that uh, the folks at the hotel are big uh, American football fans, right? Why do we play the Super Bowl? We play the Super Bowl to figure out which team is better. We can't know, right, without playing which team is better. And the same in, in the marketplace, right? Competition in the, there we go. Competition in the marketplace uh, helps us figure out how to do things and how, how, how best to do things, okay? So microeconomics. The last part here, macro, uh, let me start by saying one thing here. Those of you, again, who maybe know a little bit about Austrian economics might be surprised to hear me talk about macroeconomics in a talk on Austrian economics, because certainly there are some people who argue Austrian economics shouldn't have anything to do with macro. Um, they're wrong. Uh, as my own, <laughs> it, well, if, let's put it this way. If they're right, my career has been uh, for nothing. Uh, having written on Austrian macroeconomics quite a bit. But there are some things that Austrians have to say about macroeconomics as well. One of them is the idea that money is non-neutral. Now, what does that mean? It means money has real effects. If we expand the money supply, it's not just like we double everything and we make everything more expensive and we make everyone's wages higher. We actually have real changes that take place in the economy. And this is when we think about the cost of inflation. This is part of that, too. The capital structure consists of what we heterogeneous good, different goods, okay, uh, and, and that have multi-specific uses. There's a good word, right? Uh, that that uh, that must be must be aligned. So what does this mean, right? This is a complicated sentence, even for those of us who speak English. Uh, uh, capital goods are specific goods that have particular uses. We can't just use capital goods for anything. We have to figure out what to do with them, right? So, the, so when we think about labor, when we think about other kinds of machines, part of, that, part of what we have to figure out is how do we use them? What, what can we produce with them and what do, people, what do people want, okay? And then finally, I'm not sure this is really macro, but I put it here anyway. Social institutions are often the result of human action but not human design, what we call and what Hayek called spontaneous order. That's a key part of, of how Austrians understand the world, that, that, uh, that just because something is orderly doesn't mean that someone consciously uh, sat down and designed it. So those are the 10 propositions that, um, that Pete talks about in that article. Now I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna group them up a little bit and say, say some more about, about each one of, or not each one of them, about, about the, about the issues and themes that they raise. Okay. So we'll, first one we'll call cost and choice. Okay. And we're going to put these two things together here. Only individuals choose. Utility and costs are subjective. Together, these are sometimes uh, known as what we, we sometimes call this methodological individualism. That is, the method, the way we go about studying economics is that we talk about individuals choosing. As I said before, we, we often metaphorically say things like Amazon did something or the government did something or Walmart did something. But what we really mean when we say that is that individuals within those organizations made choices. That's true of the government as well, right? It's a really important point, one that I'm not going to stress this morning. But when we think about governments doing things, it's really important to remember that the government is made up of individuals with interests of their own who when they choose are choosing on the basis of the kind of incentives that they face, just like people in the market do. And again, I can't say too much more about it, but if you're familiar with, uh, with the work of public choice economics with James Buchanan, this is sort of the, the, a theme that we, that we see there. Uh, it's important to remember that what this is not saying is that only sort of individuals exist or that these firms somehow like Amazon doesn't exist or governments don't exist. They exist. They're real. Those institutions matter. Okay. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's only individuals who choose. And when we think about analyzing social processes and economic processes, we have to start the stories and the theoretical accounts we give with the ch choices that individuals are making, uh, whether it's within a household, whether it's with you know, people who work at Amazon, people who work in the government. As I suggested earlier, this is part of what Austrians call subjectivism. 
Our understanding of, of individual human action begins with the actor's perception of her situation and the choices that she might make. That's where our stories start. Right? If we want to understand why the economy is doing what it's doing, we have to start with, okay, why are individuals making the choices that they are making? Okay? And it's the things that those individuals believe and think that start those stories. People value certain things for whatever reasons they have. You like country music, you don't like country music. That leads them to make certain choices. Those choices have consequences, and we follow out the explanations of those consequences, and particularly how those choices interact with each other in the marketplace. But what we start with is the subjective perceptions of, of the actors involved. And that's, again, what McCloskey means by, by when she says, economics is between, is between your ears. Let me say two things about utility and cost, too, because this is often, again, for people who've studied some economics, this is a distinctly Austrian point. When we talk about utility, when Austrians talk about utility in economics, we don't mean like a happy feeling, <laughs> okay? Utility just means something's useful. Oftentimes, if you've taken some economics, you'll use these examples where you talk about utilities, and we say, well, what about diminishing uh, marginal utility? Well, you have a piece of cake, and it tastes really good, and then a second piece of cake, and it maybe tastes better, but eventually you have a third or a fourth piece, and it doesn't taste very good. After. It's kind of how I felt yesterday for a little while. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't taste very good after a while. Okay, that might be true, but that's not really what Austrians mean when we talk about utility. It's not that feeling. Rather, it's the usefulness of the good. And when Austrians talk about diminishing marginal utility, what we mean is people use the goods that they have for the most important things first, then the next most important, then the next most important, then the next most important, okay? And so when we, for example, if, we, if you find yourself stranded on an island somewhere and you have water and you have to figure out what to do with it, you're going to use it for the thing you think is most important first, perhaps drinking, and then maybe uh, watering a garden so you can eat, right, and then maybe washing your clothes, right, we, that's that way of thinking about things, the idea that we, we, we rank order the importance of things that we have and we allocate our resources accordingly, that's what Austrians mean when we talk about, about utility. It's a judgment about the ability of goods to fulfill our wants, okay, and that's, I think that's really important. So costs also, costs importantly for Austrians are subjective. Almost everyone who studies economics, at least I hope so, understands base, the basic idea of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the thing that you give up, right? The next best choice, you, you, the next best option you left on the table, okay? And that's, as far as it goes, that, that's right, and it's a good definition. Austrians would add two important points to that, though, and I think they're worth emphasizing. First of all, what that cost is is ultimately your perception. It's a subjective perception. Only you know, right? What you, what you gave up. And the my favorite example of this is when you go to a restaurant and you're trying to decide between ordering two different dishes. Okay? Should I get, last night, should I get the moussaka? Should I get the chicken? Okay? And I decided on the moussaka. Very good choice, by the way. It was excellent. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I passed on the chicken. So we know, right, economics says, well, what's the opportunity cost? Opportunity cost is the chicken I gave up that I didn't have. Austrian would say, secondly, only you know that, and only you have a sense of just how difficult that choice was and how valuable those two things were to you, okay? But it even goes one step farther. Here's the really important part. I'll never know what my cost was. Why? Because I didn't have the chicken, right? Chicken could have been really, really good, right? <laughs> Judging by the rabbit that Sarah had, it probably was, all right? But I'll never know. Okay? And when we choose, we're always choosing between two ex subjective expectations of things. How good is the moussaka going to be? How good is the chicken going to be? I'm imagining it, right? but I'll never know for sure. By the way, this is why it's great to go out with someone else for dinner. Because I, we shared last night. So she, I got to have a little bit of the rabbit and she got a little moussaka. So we both kind of had a sense of our opportunity cost <laughs> right, by sharing. But when you go out for yourself, right, you don't know. You'll never know. I mean, unless you go back to the restaurant, right? You, can, and you don't know. And even then, right, if you go back, it could be a different chef. Than a, a, you, don't, you never experience your cost. And that's a really important point for Austrians. And that notion that when we choose, we're standing there choosing between, in, in, into an uncertain future, choosing between two different expectations, right? 
Uh, and, and if you want to think about it this way, when we make a choice, it's like we're leaping over a hurdle. It's like we have to get over, buy something. We have to convince ourselves, moussaka, chicken, moussaka, moussaka. Right? And, and that point where you convince yourself right, is where you've decided, I think this one's going to be better, better than that one. Opportunity cost for Austrians is subjective expected utility. And in some sense, we never know for sure what our opportunity costs are. Okay? And that's important when we think about broader issues because it helps us realize that when, even in the realm of policy discussions, when we apply this, right, we have to think very carefully about what we mean by costs and what we mean by opportunity costs and recognize that measuring people's opportunity costs is a tricky business. Right? Trying to put a number on it is often very, very difficult. Okay. Um, so that's the cost and choice part. Institutions and exchange. I want to say a lot more about this one because I think this is an important one and it's often misunderstood. Okay. Uh, one of the misunderstandings here is, is the idea of the sort of invisible hand, which you can see is, 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 is so kind of part of this, right? And people often say things like, well, or people think that what Austrians say, are saying is that sort of self-interest exchange is, is always good and always leads to good outcomes, right? That, that, you know, if you remember from Wall Street, greed is good sort of thing. No, not necessarily, right? Well, we, we know what the simple example to show that greed isn't always good is if I take a, 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 a baseball bat and hit Alexander over the head and grab his wallet, Right? That's self-interest and greedy on my part, but it's not socially, right? We don't think that's a good thing. In fact, we'd rather that didn't happen. He certainly would rather it didn't happen, but we'd all rather it didn't happen. So not all self-interest is good, right? Not all self-interest leads to good consequences. What we want to try to understand is w under what conditions, right? Under what rules of the game, under what institutions does, does self-interest, does self-interested exchange lead to good consequences and lead to bad consequences? And that's one of the key things that Austrians study. Hayek called the market economy a catalaxy. Okay? And, and that's a that word has, of course, a lovely Greek root. And Hayek pointed out that the Greek root of that wor word not only meant to exchange, but to change from an enemy to a friend and to admit into the community, which I think is great. I'm going to say more about that Tuesday night, by the way. Uh, exchange is the foundation of economics because that's how we improve our ability to satisfy our wants. Understanding how trade is mutually beneficial because it enables us to satisfy our most urgent wants is where we start. And how well trade, how well exchange enables us to do this depends upon the institutions that frame our exchange behavior. For example, if property rights are well protected, People are more confident in things that they own, they're more likely to engage in exchange, they're more likely to, to, to benefit themselves. And if property rights are well protected, people spend fewer resources defending, having to defend their property against predation, whether private or public. Okay? So the better the rules of the game are, the, more, fewer, the fewer resources we devote sort of waste by having to defend our property, and the more ability we have and the more willingness we have to trade and, and benefit ourselves. And when we sort of do these, when we think about economics this way, this is the kind of questions we want to ask. What sorts of institutions, what sorts of rules of the game promote exchange and promote the creation of wealth and what undermine it? Some rules will make mutually beneficial exchanges easier and more likely, others won't. Protection for private property, protection of contract, the rule of law, all promote trade. Discretionary political power undermines it. Austrian economics fundamentally explores that relationship between institutions and the effectiveness of trade. Okay? And, again, and again, I think importantly, right, this doesn't mean that all self-interested behavior is good. It means we need to understand the relationship between people's pursuit of their self-interest and the rules of the game under which they do that and how those affect outcomes. That is at the core, I think, of what I would say in general good economics does, but Austrian economics in particular does. Another set of ideas that I think kind of come out of these propositions are a set around prices, knowledge, and private property. And let me put, I think, two of those propositions back up there, five and six. This is the Hayekian point about prices and knowledge. It's also the Mises point about the importance of private property. And here I'll just say a few things, okay? 
The challenge, what Hayek says the challenge we face as a society is mobilizing knowledge. Think back to a few minutes ago. Each of us knows different things. Each of us has our own perceptions of the world. Each of us values different things. How do we make that knowledge available to other people? Because that's important, right? If we want to figure out what should we produce and how should we produce it, and what are the kinds of things people should be doing in the economy, we need to know what other people value, what they want, right? How do we find that out, though? That's the difficult challenge. And Hayek argued that while you know, economists have long talked about the division of labor, more fundamental than that is the division of knowledge. That again, people know different things, knowledge is scattered and dispersed. You might think that the answer to this question is, well, okay, why can't we take all of that knowledge and sort of you know, sit down in front of a computer, pump it through the internet, and throw it all together and figure this all out and have some kind of co like computer, right? We've got all this computing power. Why can't we solve this problem with computers? We'll just figure out what people want and how people value things. And it's tempting, right? And you might have friends on the, you know, sort of socialist friends on the, on the left who sort of think this, right? Oh, we, we don't need markets. We can just solve this all by computers. There's one fundamental problem here, however. And the problem is, is that not all of the knowledge that we possess as human beings is in a form where we can put it into statistics or even into words to put into, to put into a computer. So think, uh, uh, this example I think works better in Europe than it does in the United States. How many of you can drive a standard shift car, right? A, a, a shift car. Okay, good, Just show, okay. When you learned to drive a standard shift, what's the hardest thing to learn when you drive a standard shift? The clutch, right? When to pull off the clutch, right? Because if you pull off, if you leave it in, ring, right? If you pull off too soon, the engine falls out of the car or something, right? <laughs> so here's my question. How do you know when to pull off the clutch? Or better yet, how do you keep your balance on a bicycle? Explain it to me. Your ex ex someone said experience. That's, that's an excellent answer, right? We, we know how to do it. We've learned how to do it but we can't articulate it, right? We can't explain it very well. You're solving a very complicated physics problem when you balance on a bicycle, uh, but you can't explain what it is. A great deal of the knowledge that we have, if you, have, if you know young children or have young children, when they learn to speak la their <laughs> native language, they learn to speak it largely <laughs> correct, gr grammatically correct, but no one ever taught them. And they can't explain that, right? But they do it. So there's a lot of things that we know that, that we're able to do that we can't explain, we can't put into words, we can't put into numbers. And a good deal of the knowledge in the marketplace is of this sort, okay? And for Hayek, that was a key point. What it suggested is, is that we can't put everything into a computer. We need some other way of sharing that knowledge, of making that knowledge accessible to one another. And his answer for that is, that's what the price system does. That's what markets do. When we buy and sell, we are, in essence, throwing our knowledge out there into this other kind of conversation. And, and if we demand goods and prices go up, it makes available to other people a piece of information. It sort of indicates to them that somewhere, someone thinks this good is more valuable. If we don't like it and the price goes down, the reverse. Those movements in prices serve as surrogates, as substitutes for knowledge. It's, it's sort of like we knew those things, but we don't actually know them. And we don't need to know them. In his famous 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, Hayek talks about the, the price of tin moving up and down, right? And we, he, what he points out is people don't even need to know why. Perhaps there was some kind of natural disaster, right, that destroyed a supply. We don't need to know why. In the United States, for example, if, if a frost hits the orange supply in Florida and, and, and now suddenly there's fewer oranges and we, have to, we, have to, we should be more careful about how we use them, we don't need to know that there was a frost that killed the oranges. We just have to notice that the price of oranges and orange juice and everything, up is, everything else made of oranges is going up. As it goes up, we say, ooh, more expensive, we'll buy less of it. That's what we want to happen. So prices play this crucial role in serving as what I like to call knowledge surrogates. And what this also means is that there's no other option here, right? There's no other way for that knowledge to be shared and communicated. And this is a key reason why socialist planning and attempts by socialists to replace the market are doomed to fail, 
right? It's not just a sort of political point. There's a point of economic analysis here which is without the price system, how are you going to be able to make that knowledge available to one another? How do we know what people want? How do we know what they value? No, go back to my opportunity cost question. When I buy the moussaka and not the chicken, right, I'm, I'm doing exactly this. I'm sharing my own subjective perceptions of the world that the moussaka is more valuable to me than the chicken. How else are we gonna do that if we don't have markets and a price system? And what Mises, I was going to say added to that, but he really talked about it before Hayek did, but I'm taking them in the opposite order, is that this is why we need private property in the means of production. This is why socialist schemes, when Mises was writing in the 1920s, to sort of socialize the means of production, won't work. And by won't work here, we mean won't produce wealth and progress and so on. They won't work because we, in order to have those market prices for us to share that information, we need to be able to exchange things. And if we, are able, if we are going to exchange things, we have to own them. So key to this process is the role of private property. And in particular, private property in the means of production, in capital. One of the things I think that critics of the market uh, sometimes do is they will say, okay, uh, the, when, when they think about this, that sort of n those knowledge points, they tend to think about mostly what people want, what people want to buy. It's about consumption. So, so a critic might say, okay, Horowitz, you're, what you're telling me is I need to know all the stuff people value and want to buy. If I, if I could know that, right, I could solve this problem without markets. That's only half the problem and the lesser half. The bigger half of the problem is not so much what people want to buy, but how do we make stuff, right? I've got a pile of wood in front of me. What do I use it for? For this, for that, for, right? I want to build a bridge. Should I make it out of steel, out of concrete, out of wood? What should I make it out of? Platinum? Probably not. And why won't we make it out of platinum? Assuming technologically we could. It's really, really expensive. Right? Prices help us figure out, price, prices help us decide among the technologically possible ways of doing things, the things that are economically the most efficient. And the problem facing socialist economies is that, uh, truly socialist ones, is they can't answer that question, at least not very easily. How do we know what to make things out of? It might be somewhat easy to figure out what people want. I don't think it is, but it might be. It's way harder to decide what do I do with this pile of wood. Or I have a person with a set of skills, what we call human capital. What should they do? Should they produce this thing or that thing? I have a computer. What should I use it for? That's what we need prices for. And to get prices, we need to be able to trade things. And to trade things, we need to be, have private property. It's important also to recognize here, and again, those of you who've studied some economics, this is really more of a technical point, that for Austrians, the prices we're talking about here are not sort of equilibrium market clearing prices. All prices perform this role. Austrians are much more concerned about the role that prices play all of the time, whether or not we're in or out of equilibrium. Right? Prices tell us things. They're irreplaceable forms of, commu of communication. Okay? And let me say a few things about inflation and deflation and macro in general. Um, as I said earlier, people are skeptical of the idea of Austrian macroeconomics. And, and they're right in one sense, and the sense I want to s note is that what matters for Austrians is how economic activity affects the microeconomy, the choices people make in prices and so on. And the interesting thing is when Austrians talk about, when Austrians talk about money, right, we end up talking about those microeconomic things. Why? Because Economies with too much or with too little money, the reason that matters is when there's too much or too little money, it spills over and affects our ability to trade and to create prices and to do all the things we were talking about in that, in that last section. Excesses or deficiencies in the money supply matter. They affect the real allocation of resources. They affect the ability of entrepreneurs to figure out what people want and how to get it. Then when we, and when we say money's not neutral, this is what we mean. Money has real effects. When the central bank expands the money supply, it's not like all the prices go up the same. 
Some go up by a lot, some go up by a little. It depends who gets the money first and how they spend it, according to their subjective preferences. And if some prices go up by a lot and some go up by a little, that changes the relative relationship between those prices and people suddenly start allocating resources towards the thing that now looks relatively more valuable. And we get real effects here. The real allocation of resources changes and if the inflation, let's say, stops, then the process stops too and now we have to figure out was it, what was happening here? Were, were prices really, were stuff really becoming more scarce or was it just the inflation? Right? How do we know? And the, and the allocation of resources gets completely mixed up as a result of that, inf that excess supply of money, that inflationary, that inflationary process. Inflation and deflation are harmful precisely because they hamper, they interfere with the ability of prices to play that role as knowledge surrogates. The, if you want to think of an analogy here, they make that communication system much more noisy, more static, more feedback, right? Uh, so it's harder to hear what prices are trying to say when they're being sort of uh, distorted by the inflation or deflation. Money matters for the real distribution of resources. And this is, this is one of the ways that it, that it does. And related to that is this point about capital. Okay? For Austrians, capital is not just this kind of hunk of stuff right, that we use to make things. Capital is embodied in specific capital goods. And those capital goods have a specific number of limited uses. If I have a pile of wood, I can only use it for so many things. I can't use it, right? I can't eat it. I could use it to heat up food, but I can't use, I can't eat it, for example, okay? A human being has particular skills, perhaps can't use it for other kinds of things. I, I could use computers to kill bugs. I'd have to like, drop them on the bugs or something, but that doesn't seem like a very good use of computers, right? Um, that specific capital goods have specific uses. And the challenge in any economy is to figure out how best to use them. And so one of the macroeconomic puzzles for Austrians, or one of the macroeconomic uh, uh, ways we understand the macroeconomy is that we want to try to figure out how it is that individuals in economic systems figure out how to use those capital goods. And you can think about them as being like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, of a puzzle that have to fit together. How do these goods fit together? Entre what entrepreneurs do is to take capital and labor and formulate a plan and see, does this work? If I do this, will it, will it actually produce the, uh, the outcomes that I, that I expect to see? I think I, whoop, uh, I thought I had here, don't. Um, well, I, that I expect to see. And so entrepreneurs form a budget, they purchase the resources that they need, they execute their plan, and they see what happens. If they make profits, it tells them, yeah, I, used those I created value with those resources. If they make losses, it says, no, I didn't. And if they make losses, the entrepreneurs have to say, okay, what was wrong with this plan? How do I shuffle? How do I move around my capital goods or my labor in a different combination to figure out a better way to create value? And what guides them in this process, again, are prices in the marketplace. Profits and losses, after all, are just an adding up of prices. And so part of the challenge in a sort of larger macroeconomic context, right, is figuring out how those capital goods fit together. Notice how this ties back to the socialism stuff. What you have in a market economy is individual entrepreneurs making multiple plans using all of those different capital goods and labor and resources, trying to figure out what to do with them. And it's through the competition of the marketplace that we learn through profit and loss whether we use those goods wisely. There's no comparable system, Austrians argue, if we eliminate the marketplace. And again, this is a point of economic analysis. It's about how economies work, about how people choose and behave. In the absence of markets, how will we know how to allocate those capital goods? And again, for people who say things like, well, you know, Austrian economics is just an ideology, right? You just, you just hate socialism. You don't hate socialism. Right? It doesn't work, right? Why doesn't it work? This is why it doesn't work. I mean, even Mises, by the way, said, look, if socialism worked, it'd be awesome, <laughs> right? It'd be great. Sadly, it doesn't work, okay? And if it doesn't work, right, then what do we do? How do we best meet people's needs, okay? And this, is, and this Austrian understanding of the marketplace helps us both understand why socialism doesn't work, but also understand, helps us understand why markets do. 
And this is why prices and, and calculation and all that stuff matters. Again, markets are how producers figure out which of the technologically possible ways of doing things is the economically most efficient. And that's a question, again, that's frequently overlooked uh, as, as, as people talk about this, okay? And finally, back to this idea of spontaneous order. This idea of spontaneous order, right, that, that much of the world around us, our institutions and outcomes, are the product of human action, but not human design, okay, uh, is a key Austrian insight, one that certainly is in Hayek, but goes back to Menger, and certainly back to Adam Smith and the invisible hand. The same basic, same, the same basic idea, okay. Um, and so just a couple points I want to make about this very quickly. Uh, one is the, the sort of fundamental observation that order in the world does not require a designer. Critics of markets, critics of classical liberalism frequently say things like, well, you know, if you want to have a healthy growing economy, you need someone to make sure all the pieces fit together. You need someone to help, you know, uh, uh, plan and put those puzzle pieces where they go, at least to some degree, right? Otherwise, you'll just have chaos. Well, no, actually, you won't, okay? If you have the right institutions, if the rules of the game are right, allowing people to pursue their self-interest will produce beneficial results for people in general, right? Led by an invisible hand to promote an end that was no part of their intention. That's how I'm more close to how Adam Smith put it, okay? And we see, again, in, 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 in other people, they are the results of human action but not human design. That's from Adam Smith's contemporary, Adam Ferguson. All kinds of ways of understanding this basic insight. And at the core of that insight is the idea that if the rules of the game, if the institutions are right, we can leave people to choose on their own, to trade, and in the process of doing that, they'll produce market prices that will guide other people's actions. As other people look at those prices and figure out what to do and learn, people's economic activities will be coordinated. The result will be wealth and prosperity uh, for, for all of us. It's also important to understand here that some of the institutions themselves, right, were not created by humans. The common law, crucial to one of the crucial rules of the game is itself an evolving spontaneous order. Nobody sat down one day and wrote down all the laws. It's evolved over time. Spontaneous order processes, by the way, can be very messy. We were just joking before I started talking about the evolution of Athens, <laughs> right? And, and uh, old cities, right, have all these crazy streets that go all in these different directions because that's how, it, that's how it evolved and emerged, right? And this morning, that was a real challenge for many of us getting here. Uh, doesn't, spontaneous orders don't always look pretty, but they work, okay? And getting, so, you know, my favorite example of spontaneous order where I, I taught for many years in the very northern part of the United States near Canada, very snowy and very cold. And when it would snow on the campus, you'd go out in the morning and about, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you'd start to see these paths worn through the snow, where people had been walking. And they were very useful, right, to get from one classroom to another. You had this path dug in the snow. And people used to sort of joke, well, there must be this mysterious, like, person who goes out there with a thing and rolls out these paths. No, right? Just somebody walks and somebody follows in their footsteps and a few more people do and you slowly tramp down a path. That's, by the way, how we get paths through the woods and that's how we got roads and that's why we have, right, these cr crazy streets in old cities, okay? Spontaneous order processes work. They're not always beautiful, but but they work. Okay, so let me end with a few thoughts and I'll open for questions. Uh, I want to come back to this Austrian economics and classical liberalism, libertarianism stuff. Classical liberalism, libertarianism, whatever word we want to use, is a political philosophy. Austrian economics is a social scientific framework. It's not that they're unrelated, okay? As I said at the beginning, there are many Austrian economists who are classical liberals, and, and there are Austrian economists who, there are, there are people who are not Austrian economists who are classical liberals, right? My, my favorite example of this would be my friend Brian Kaplan, right? You may know Brian's work. Brian is a, is a very hardcore libertarian classical liberal, but he's not an Austrian economist. Great, that's wonderful. And there's other people who would call themselves Austrian economists, but aren't super hardcore classical liberals. My friend Roger Koppel might fall into that category, okay? So, there's, so we're, we're, it's all over the map. 
And it's important to make the distinction. I think one reason is, if we want Austrian economics to be influential, we're going to have to make clear that it's not just an ideology. It's not just these guys who go around saying, you know, yay capitalism, boo socialism. Right? That rather it has a set of propositions, an analytical structure that helps us understand the world. If we understand the world that way, okay, then that helps us get to policy conclusions. It helps us understand why classical liberalism might be valuable. But it can't do it by itself. Right? All, as Mises pointed out over and over again, all economics, Austrian economics can do, is tell you what will be the consequences of particular policies. It can't tell you whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You import those values. Now, what Mises also said is if we think that prosperity and peace and social cooperation and progress are good things, right? Well, okay then, right? If we think those are good things, then yes, we want to adopt classical liberal institutions, right? That will make, because they will promote those ends. And Austrian economics helps us understand why, right? But economics on its own, Mises said, is value-free. And what he meant by that was, it only tells us what will happen, right? It can't tell us whether that's a good thing or not. And so when we do things like interpreting history, right, and trying to tell historical, historical stories or trying to understand other policies in the world, Austrian economics by itself isn't enough. Okay, we need these other things. One last point. I could do a whole talk on this one, but I'm going to do two minutes. Austrian economics and natural rights. There are many classical liberals, libertarians, who are strong promoters of the idea of natural rights, that people have rights, and those rights should be respected, and that's what matters, right? They, they trump, so to speak, everything else, okay? And that's a perfectly legitimate libertarian position, right? That's Robert Nozick, it's Ayn Rand, it's most many other libertarians believe that. But if you really believe that, it's not clear what role economics plays, or put it the other way, right? Economics doesn't, the, the, the great Austrian economists had no use for natural rights. Mises thought they were, thought that whole argument was silly. Hayek never, almost never, almost never talks about natural rights. They were what we would broadly today call consequentialists. What they were concerned about is what are the consequences of adopting certain kinds of institutions or certain kinds of, 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 of structures. Okay? Not, they weren't about natural rights. And so I just want to point out that there's an interesting tension there. Okay? And you know, my philosopher friends think it's not as, big as, as, much of, as much of a tension as I think it is, but that's an interesting debate to have. But for Austrian economists, and I will say, for me as an economist, I have no use for natural rights arguments. I think rights are important, right? I've been talking about property rights and all these other kinds of things. But what justifies them is the fact that they are useful, that they have good consequences, that we know they will produce peace and prosperity and social cooperation. Not that they're given to us by our nature or by God or by something else. Not that they're natural. Okay? And so I just want to sort of leave that out there for you to think about as you're thinking about uh, uh, classical liberalism in general. And, and I should be clear, right? I think natural rights arguments are perfectly legitimate ways to defend classical liberalism. They're just different from, and I think in tension with, arguments from economics and from Austrian economics in particular. So I hope that what I've done this morning, I know there's a lot of sort of Econ heavy stuff in here. But I hope that at least what I've tried to do is show you that Austrian economics is, as I started out by saying, a way of understanding, first and foremost, a way of understanding the world. It's not a set of political principles, it's not an ideology, right? It is a social scientific framework. If, and it, I think, is the most valuable uh, social scientific framework, at least the economics framework for understanding the world. Um, and if you understand it and know it well, and if you care about creating a world of prosperity and peace and social cooperation, it's a key piece in understanding why classical liberalism uh, is so important and so valuable. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take a few questions. <laughs> you have to applaud longer so I can drink more water. That's good. <laughs> no, 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 no. Presentation. And... Uh, we're open for questions. Start with Professor Fetis. Uh, thank you so much for such a fascinating lecture. 
Uh, I have just one question. You mentioned the rules of the games uh, mm. of the game several times. So I, I was wondering if there is a comprehensive, coherent Austrian theory on institutions. Is it just the minimal state, um, yeah. rule of law, private property, freedom of contract, or uh, are there any Austrian answers to issues like collective uh, action problems, yeah. um, in poverty and inequality? Or um, stuff like uh, uh, what else? Uh, prisoners dilemma yeah. that this goes under uh, collective action problems. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if there is a, if there is an Austrian institutional theory similar to the theories uh, proposed by Chicago by uh, yeah. more uh, mainstream uh, people. That's a that's a great question. So I'm going to break it into two parts, right? The, the, the sort of in the most Austrian sort of view of those larger scale institutions, right? Like like uh, the, the overarching rules of the game, like private property, so on and so forth. I think certainly, you, I mean, highest constitution of liberty would be an example of that. But I also think that's where Buchanan, Jim, Jim Buchanan's work is really important. And some of the other constitutional political economy people in public choice who, who oftentimes are working from certainly methodological individualist and uh, spontaneous order and, and sometimes subjectivist type stuff, and Buchanan in particular, of course, uh, gives us a theory of those larger scale institutions. I think for the more the stuff like the game theory and, and all that, there's been less written about that. I, I mentioned Roger Koppel has done maybe a little bit of stuff. Uh, Dick Langlois at the University of Connecticut has done some, back in the 80s and 90s, had done some stuff on that. I'm trying to think what, who else? Yeah, that's actually, yeah, I mean, Vernon, Smith's, Vernon Smith and Bart Wilson's work um, is, is, well, let's put it this way, it's Austrian enough to have won the book award this year at the, at the annual meeting, so yeah, so, the, so their book, Humanomics, their new recent book, I think, gives you a good sense of that, too, and some of the work that they cite in there, I think, would be a good example of that, but that said, it's a great question, because I think it's a nice you know, if you're anyone going on for a PhD in economics looking for a dissertation topic, right, there's a, there's an excellent one. Next question. I, I would, yeah, over here. Uh, yeah. I know all the staff wants to ask me questions, uh, but I'm going to call Thank you very student. much. <laughs> uh, my question is, oh, well, uh, this uh, lecture is looked to me a lot like you introduced a set of rules, like axioms, and then try to predict and explain a model through the social scientific framework that you set through mm -hmm. the propositions. Uh, my question is, has there been any attempts for a mathematical formulation for this? Because it looked a lot like you were setting axioms yeah. and producing theorems and predicting, and because of the whole scientific yeah, nature yeah. of the framework. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some folks who have tried to do that with pieces of the story. I think it's very difficult to do. Uh, for the, I mean, it goes back to the difficulties of specifying exactly what it is that people know and how would we do that, right? We think about most models in economics, right? The modeler or the economist is, is acting as if he or she knows what the agents know and modeling that way. And the whole point here is that that's exactly what we don't know. And I think it goes back to the question about game theory too. Part of the problem, an Austrian game theoretic model would have to be one where, where part of the problem is, is that the players don't know what the model is, right? The players don't know what the payoffs are and they're trying to learn as they go, right? So I think when we recognize, and I didn't talk a lot about it in the second half, but when we recognize this point about discovery processes, it becomes difficult to specify ahead of time what those things are. I think it's, you know, if there's people who want to try to do that, I think it's, uh, I think it's an interest, it would be interesting to attempt to model those things mathematically. I just think it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. And I would add, that's one of the challenges that Austrians face, is that we're still in a world where people think in the social sciences that mathematical modeling is the standard of scientific rigor, right? That that's what makes you scientific is that you can model it that way. And I think part of what Austrians need to do is to challenge that directly and say that's not the only way. It, it's 
one way, but not the only way to demonstrate analytical rigor, right? Uh, there are other ways. You can have a rigorous non-mathematical -math theory, and you can have one that, and you can talk about it as being falsifiable and whatever other criteria you want. So, but I think it's a, you know, there, there's been a few attempts. I don't think they've been super successful, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't be. Other, other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes? Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, what's, I don't understand what's the difference between uh, your presentation on Austrian economics and uh, neoclassical theory. And second, uh, how you can incorporate cooperative and non-cooperative solutions on a framework like the Austrian economics. Uh, I think the, so let me, in order, I think the big difference if, if a non aust there are a number of those propositions that non-Austrian economists would not, either wouldn't agree with or wouldn't talk about the same way. Um, uh, the, the stuff on subjectivism, for example, I think they wouldn't be, uh, value that would be subjective, but when we sort of go deeper into expectations and, and opportunity costs, most Neoclassical economists wouldn't talk about it that way. Most neoclassical economists would have a different understanding of the prices and knowledge point. Hmm? We have the belief that we have the difference between the belief, yeah. expected utility and yeah. utility. Yeah, right. But even, a, even expected utility models, right, are often in terms of a known pattern of outcomes and we just take, right. So if we, but if we think about things like uh, the, the heterogeneity of capital goods is, uh, and all that stuff, you won't see that from mainstream economists. Capital is, a, is, is, is K in a Cobb-Douglas equation or something like that. Uh, the money's not neutral, uh, unusual, maybe among some post-Keynesian types. Uh, and the price is a knowledge point, and I sort of hinted at this, but, but mainstream economists, uh, the Hayek 1945 use of knowledge paper is one of the most cited papers in the history of economics, but it's often miscited, I think, by mainstream economists who think what Hayek is saying is that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that equilibrium prices are fully informative, that equilibrium prices provide us with all the information that we need to make decisions. And that's not what he's saying, but that's nonetheless how it's interpreted, and I think that's how a mainstream economist would talk about it. I didn't do competition much with competition, but certainly, right, competition would be talked about very differently as well. And, and again, I, that's, you know, I uh, don't, don't take that to mean I think that somehow mainstream economics is, is a bunch of garbage. It's not. It's, it's valuable, and when I teach economics, I, that's what I, mostly what I have to teach, and I, and I rightfully so. Um, but I think, I think there is a difference between Austrian economics and, 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 and that neoclassical mainstream. And the other question was about cooperative and non-cooperative. Um, I don't think, I think one of the things that we've seen people interested in Austrian economics become more interested in in the last 10 or 20 years uh, is the work of, the, of, of Eleanor Ostrom, right, and the sort of work on, on common property and, and, and common resources like that and sort of thinking about um, how do people come up with solutions for using resources efficiently that aren't really about markets and private property but aren't also really about government in the sort of traditional sense. They're about governance, about how do we come to develop rules and agreements and co cooperative agreements to, go to govern our actions. Uh, and I think that kind of goes to the other question here too, about how to, uh, uh, wh what would an Austrian theory of institutions look like? And I think it's underdeveloped, but I don't think there's anything in the theory that prevents us from, from doing it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't think um, game theory and uh, Austrian economics are easily compatible because the hyper-rationalistic yeah. assumptions in game theory are quite simply incompatible yeah. with uh, what, let's call it, more philosophical, praxeological approach which you find in Austrian economics. Uh, I, although I am a philosopher and uh, Economist, I work in political science. I mm -hmm. think hardline uh, rational choice theory in political science, I think, is dead quite simply. Mm -hmm. And public choice theory, uh, I think, can be restated uh, as uh, uh, most of it as classical questions in political philosophy. Mm -hmm. We can use this uh, Austrian economics, game theory, public choice, all of this to throw light on classical questions mm. in political philosophy. So there is no, uh, I, I don't see any, 
big problems. It's different right. approaches to classical questions and somewhat enlightening. I uh, was, I studied under a famous game theorist, John Elster, mm -hmm. and I listened very carefully uh, to Israel Kirsner, and I worked for years trying to combine it. Ah. It, it quite simply doesn't work uh, together, and we must be able to live with these uh, conflicts of approaches and to live, use various models of reality without uh, freaking out. They are <laughs> different yes. kinds of different philosophies. Yes, and I'll just I'll add one point to that, though, that, that I think is worth noting. Game th the, or the origins of game theory in von Morgenstern, of course, came out of early 20th century Vienna and, and the sort of same circles that Mises and Hayek were running in. And I think the key to your argument is that what's happened over time, of course, is that those models have been hyper-rationalized in a way that I think is incompatible. But I think if you go back to the early earlier uh, when, when the sort of emergence of game theory okay one of the key things that was happening there was was a kind of subjectivist uh, how how do I choose when I have to take other people's choices into account kind of story and that becomes that's a different way of thinking about game theory that I think is compatible with a broad with this sort of broader uh, set of ideas that you're talking about because we do behave strategically and and we often do it because we we, ha we have to our perceptions clash with the perceptions of, of, of others. Uh, yes, so when you were speaking on uh, making choices, and uh, I think you used the, the term knowledge surrogates. So uh, prices are knowledge surrogates, yes. So uh, I was uh, tended to think more and more on the uh, choices made by my 15-year-old daughter. <laughs> and uh, her uh, schoolmates. So. Uh, their choices are not based so much on utility and costs, which they, they have a different perception of them, but on likes and dislikes. And yeah. I would like you to comment on whether you think, uh, especially if you think now that uh, uh, Facebook and Alphabet, they are also developing a, a currency system. How yeah. to this yeah. and knowing also the, the work uh, behind the uh, algorithm on uh, how to uh, to uh, influence choices. Yeah. Well. Uh, so whether you think uh, uh, this is an alternative or uh, something, uh, of course, not equally as uh, prices, uh, a system uh, yeah. equally uh, to be equally functional as, as pricing but uh, uh, something that uh, uh, you would consider for the future. So uh, uh, there's a lot in those questions. I think one thing I'd say is young people, so I mean, those of you who know me know that I use Facebook a lot too, so I might be talking about myself here too. Uh, that, that Look, I, it's, they're still choosing on the basis of utility and cost. They're just have different perceptions about what gives them utility and what those costs are, right? So if, if they're after you know, doing things on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or wherever that they want, they want to get likes or retweets or whatever it might be. They're just have, it's a different set of values that they're, that they're having. Now, whether, you know, it's, it has always been true that institutions influence our choices, whether it's the algorithm in Facebook, whether it's advertising, um, all kinds of things. That doesn't mean we don't choose, and that doesn't mean we're not, that doesn't mean we're being made worse off by the fact that those things influence us. Uh, they, they just, they're there, they're, they're, they're part of, they're part of the, the sort of furniture of, out, of, out of which we choose. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, there is, there's no such thing as a world where we choose free of influence. At the very least, the people we love and care about influence us in all kinds of different ways, okay? Uh, I think you persuaded me to get the moussaka last night. Uh, so, so that's how that's how life works, right? So I'm not that doesn't concern me very much. I, I, this, the stuff about the Facebook currency uh, that we can maybe talk during a break. I honestly don't know a lot about it. I haven't looked at it closely, but I think some of those. I think there's interesting things about all those alternative currency stuff and and and, and cyber currencies and all that that that, uh, that I find fascinating and some problems with them too. How, do, how much more time do we have? Maybe for another, question. another question? Okay, last one, I guess. Two? Two? Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you, how do you think that artificial intelligence 
especially once it surpasses human intelligence, uh, will influence the ability of socialist planning? Yeah, so the, the, question, the, the question is whether, A, I don't know enough about AI to, to say this definitively. The question, however, is whether artificial intelligence can capture everything that's important about how humans think and value and understand. Um, it's still, I am still very skeptical of the claim that we could have some kind of supercomputer or some form of artificial intelligence that could solve the problem that markets solve through exchange and prices and so on solve is a strong word, address every s single day. Um, when you really think about the staggering complexity of that problem and the kinds of knowledge that go, go into it, not clear that even the best AI we can imagine can solve it. I also think, by the way, that if, if you're also thinking that artificial intelligence will sort of, uh, you know, uh, this sort of will take over human work, there's, there's always human work to be done. There's, uh, there's always, until someone persuades me that AI can create art the way humans do, there will always be uh, a need for humans to do certain kinds of things that machines can't. So I'll just leave that there. But again, we can talk more about that as well. Was there, was there one more back there? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the most mm -hmm. interesting lecture. I would like to, um, prefer, um, probably you have already um, no, um, commented on that, but, and I may have missed it. But just in case I haven't, you haven't mentioned, I'm, um, I'm quite interested in um, countries' um, communication interaction and especially the internalization, uh, especially Greek internalization. Uh, so how do Austrian economics uh, refer on that? So how do countries should interact on uh, yeah. the economy yeah. level? Yeah, so, 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 so yeah. Uh, I think there's a simple answer uh, and then a more complex one. The simple answer is, is that uh, the same story Austrians tell about why individuals trading with each other are mutually beneficial is the story of international trade, right? When we think, put it a different way, go back to only individuals choose. Countries don't trade with each other. Individuals within countries do or firms, the individuals in firms within countries or households within countries do. So if we think it's good that individuals trade with each other down the street, across Athens, across Greece, then there's no reason why we sh they shouldn't be able to freely trade with each other uh, uh, across national boundaries. That's the simple answer. More complicated answers, the rules of the game question, right? Which is, okay, that's easy enough to say, but what, what are the right sets of rules for international trade? How do we resolve disputes? And those kinds of questions, right? I think, I think that's a more complicated one and one where, where help from things like public choice theory and these other tools can, can get us to think more carefully about institutions and rules of the game and which ones are, are the ones that best promote that trade. But as a fundamental proposition, uh, if, if we, you know, the freedom of international trade provides the same benefits that freedom of trade down the street does and, and uh, to the degree that an Austrian analysis shows us why that's wealth enhancing, same thing for trade uh, between, uh, between people in Greece and people in the United States. Well, once again, thank you very much for thank your you all. Thank you all very, very insightful much. presentation and the discussion we had. We'll take a short break of uh, about 10 minutes, then we'll go on. <laughs>